joining me live. So do me a favor and type in wherever you are joining me in from. If you're on YouTube, do me a favor and hit that subscribe button and then click the little bell so that you'll get uh, notifications when I go live. And the same for those of you watching on Facebook, make sure that uh, you like the page so that you'll know as well. And on LinkedIn, we don't have those options. So there you go. Uh, hey, Joanne, glad you're here this morning. Uh, so the um, end of the year brings a lot of opportunities. And uh, this just in this morning that according to MasterCard, U.S. retail sales rose 2.4% uh, between November 1st and Christmas Eve compared with the same period a year ago. That's exclusive of autos and gasoline. By the way, whenever you hear those numbers, that's what you want to hear because sometimes uh, gas and autos really skew results down. For one simple reason right now, we're driving a lot less and because of that, we're not buying as much gasoline and new cars. So there you go. Hey, good morning, Stace. Glad you're here from Saratoga. David from Wilmington, North Carolina. I was actually born in Wilmington, uh, Delaware, so I don't know. Was that anything, David? Uh, Carmen, hello from the UK. Locked down there. Sorry about that. Uh, and Kristen from Massachusetts. Oh, I've got a whole new interface here this morning. I see everybody's pictures, Allison, uh, from uh, LinkedIn. Fabulous. So um, I hope you had enjoyed an increase. I think there's an awful lot of opportunity out there right now. As you know, I am brick and mortar's biggest uh, advocate. I feel like sometimes I'm the dinosaur moving out to the desert as uh, other people kind of look at everything is going to be online all the time. However, on a uh, CNBC uh, post yesterday, they had to acknowledge that still only 14.5% of retail sales was online. If you have listened to any of the news for the last, I don't know, nine months, you would think it was 90% of the world was online and we were never going to go back. And that's just not true. But I do want you to be thinking about, as we come to the end of the year, it's time to use your choice muscle. You can either use your choice to look back and see all that you've lost and the things that went bad this year and have a pity party for yourself and you know that gets you absolutely nowhere or you can look back at what you gained the creativity the new muscles you all, all, uh, developed the new technologies the new way that you connected with fans there's a million things and then also understand you have a choice muscle now as we close this year out <clears throat> and look into january that you have a choice to either look forward with fear and uh you know trembling or you look forward to it and say it's a new year and start looking for the opportunities. I encourage you to use your choice muscle to look there because there's going to be enough people that are going to tell you you shouldn't be uh, optimistic and be a realist and all these other things. And, you know, I think realist, uh, there is a place for us. But at the other side of us, I think that an awful lot of realism is uh, just um, people looking to make you feel bad because somehow that gets some more clicks. And to me, that's not it. So uh, there you go. I've tried myself to stay away from that, but there are times that I get caught in the warning you with dire uh, BuzzFeed uh, headlines because sadly, that's what you tend to click on. <laughs> I, can have, I can have a post five ways to be more hopeful about the world and might be like, eh, whatever. And I say, five mistakes that are going to kill you next year, I know that you'll click on it. And that's the problem that we know how we, our attention can be captivated. So uh, I do want to, before I get too far, I want to make sure that you register for my free webinar. It's going to be on January 7th at 11 a.m. Eastern time. And I'll post that link after I go live with this. And you'll be able to uh, register. It's uh, I'll be covering the seven mistakes there you go. Retailers uh, need to stop making to have a successful 2021. And then four actions you can do now to actually have a better uh, year ahead. So I hope that uh, works for you. Uh, boy, all my comments seem to be showing up there. We don't want all that stuff. All right. Uh, and then also the SalesRx Sprint, which we start, we only do that four times a year. And the next one is going to be January 14th will be the cutoff. And I'll put the link in up there. You basically register for a dollar and then you'll be still buying the reg regular SalesRx subscription, but you'll get a bonus of five weeks with me to hold you accountable and to get away from being able to say, oh, I don't have time or, oh, I forgot. I will hold you accountable. And the sprints seem to be a good way for us to hold each other accountable. So there you go. But just be aware that this is the week that you're going to tend to look backwards and people are going to tend to post things and you're going to end up having that fear that somebody else got ahead of you or didn't. And I just say, how many sales that you deserve to make this year walked out your door? 
Or how much money did you leave on the table? And I'm talking to you sewing retailers and bike retailers and pool retailers and retailers of outdoor equipment and things like that and even hardware stores who were riding a tailwind of interest because you sold like you've always sold and so people had interest in something and you sold them what they asked for but you didn't really sell the whole package. And so if you're interested in fixing that, then I certainly encourage you to join me on my webinar. And then more importantly, the week after when we start up with SalesRx, my online retail sales training program. Susan uh, has, uh, so it's interesting today, you all kind of commented on everybody's questions yesterday, which is unusual for me. Uh, usually you ask me a question and then like, well, what do you think? And this time a lot of people jumped in and, and added. So as I go through these, I will be... Um, adding in some of your quotes as well before I give you what I think. So there you go. And if I don't say it enough, I just think that you are here with me on a Sunday morning when you could be doing a million other things to hear what I have to say. So I appreciate you. I appreciate your interest in me. And all I want to do is to give value and hope to you in your small business or medium or large size business, quite simply, because retail is responsible for one in four jobs in America. And brick and mortar retail in in particular is being maligned right now as the, you know, uh, bad thing. And the, yet, the way I look at it is the hub that everything else works off of. If that's your goal, if that's what your understanding is, then I can help you with that. But make no mistake, we aren't going to go back to 2019. You can't go back to the way you sold in the, in the 60s and just have asked and answered and expect to be successful. So I appreciate your question so I have a chance to weigh in. Susan says, how do you address staff who are addicted to their phones? Bonnie added in, tell them to leave them in their vehicles. They can check their phone on their brakes. The phones will not be allowed in the store. If seen on their phones during work time, I would dock their pay for every minute they were on the phone. They'll get the drift when their check reflects less money. And then Lauren added in, my employees use their phone to manage our social media, etc. I don't know where to draw the line because I don't know when they're on it for business and when it's personal. Boy, we got a lot of uh, got a lot of points. If you are having to have employees lock phones in their car and you are docking minutes, I can guarantee you, you have hired people you can't trust with your merchandise. Sorry, but either you trust them or you're not. You know, the definition of me of a good employee is would you give your keys to a new car to them to drive? Because if you really believe they're, they're untrainable or they're out just to use things, I think you get what you look for. I do say look at your own behavior. I know that I have an Apple phone, and even though I'm on my desktop here, 5 a.m. usually till 5 p.m., my phone is calculating my screen time and it's telling me how often I'm on it and checking it. And I would admit that in the last year, my own behavior has gotten worse uh, about using a phone. And so just realizing, don't expect them to do something different than you. I know that when I've worked with some retailers, they've told me how um, you know they require all these things and then yet they get to keep their phone. Oh, well, you know, if a customer has a question, I need to be able to answer it. And so you have this double system. So consider for the new year, maybe you're going to do a digital cleanse and you're not going to be using your cell phones during uh, the, you know, the day. I would say be careful you're not making this into uh, this insurmountable thing to police. Your most important thing is to greet and help every customer. If you're locked down to 20% of occupancy, there's going to be a lot of dead time and lag time. And unless you're going to train people, oh yeah, there's SalesRx, my online training program, that would actually help you figure out how to engage people that to keep the minds busy. Unless you do that, unless you move the store around, unless you go through and are constantly thinking, how do I engage the brain? They are going to be drawn to the jackpot of, well, there might be something new on Facebook or Instagram or WhatsApp or any number of things. And so I throw it back to you to say, if you want to get them off their cell phones, keep them busy and keep their minds working and make it as productive as possible for your store. Because a lot of big brands do allow people to use their cell phones on their, store, on their floor because they are answering text. They're using a company like Podium or some other ones to be able to group uh, message and talk to people or sell virtually. There's a lot of reasons why a cell phone is not what it was five years ago. So again, look at your own behavior and then hire people that you can trust. I hope that helps. Uh, good morning, Rachel. Glad you're here from Hillsborough, Ohio. I grew up in Toledo, not too far from there. Good morning, Mary from Paso Robles. Appreciate that. Got Holly from Hamilton, from Paw Paw, Michigan. Uh, and I've got 
Tsutomu, Tsutomu from Japan. Glad you're here. I don't know. Is that tomorrow that you're here? I'm not quite sure. Uh, Jeff, glad you're here from Quincy, Illinois. I appreciate that. Mohammed from Qatar, and we have lots of you on, I just can't say hi to you, sorry. Um, uh, let's just keep going. So, Top Fan Carolyn asks, I'm trying to plan my buying for January before I'm going to Atlanta. I'm optimistic, but want to be realistic. Any advance for the first quarter of 2021? My business was up over last year, despite 2020's best efforts. I think you mean it's up over last year, right? Uh, but I'm a little cautious about the first quarter. So whenever people ask about setting goals, the thing I always go back to, if you've been through a hurricane, you've been through something that's extraordinary, you just want to go through and average your last three to five years of operation. So you're going to take all of 2020, 2019, 2018, look at it as a calendar, and then average all your Januaries, all your Februarys, March, etc., because that gets rid of the holidays. And then you're going to divide that into... Uh, each of those uh, months so that you know what was the percentage of our business that we got in each of those months. That will certainly help you. Takes out some of those highs and lows. And then look at what you think uh, that goal is going to be. Only you can know that. But I would be a big believer of saying less is more. Most retailers entered the holiday season with about 50% of the normal inventory. I hope that was you because that meant that they had a lot of room and a lot of margin going into the holidays and they didn't have a lot to get rid of. So understand that being lean the first quarter is still going to be really important in probably the first half uh, and, and realize that that's your money sitting on the floor. So if it's a nice to have, then um, it probably can wait. If it's I must have because this fills a hole, and again, most of you are brilliant uh, merchants because when I talk to you, you know your categories, you know what you're missing, you know what you sell out of then make sure that you have filled those holes in. But the days of just going to a show and saying, oh, that's so cute, and then ordering a few uh, just aren't there because most uh, small businesses buy what they like, not what sells. And the problem with that is you don't have a plan of how you're going to sell it when it's new, much lo less sell it when it's not new. You know, a lot of us let our employees get 20% off. They buy the newest stuff. So that takes out uh, a, a portion of it at margin. And then um, they didn't pay full price for it. They don't really have to understand it. And then whenever a sale comes, they push it. And then you put it on sale. And at the end of the day, if you don't have a sophisticated POS system like Lightspeed or some others, you don't really know what happened to your margins. And suddenly you, if someone comes in, they look at your margins are in the 20s. And it's like, what the hell are you doing? This is a hobby. This isn't a business. You need to keep those margins up there if you want to be in business. And I don't have time to get into all of that, but I hope that helps Carolyn. Uh, Kristen says, we're a relatively new store, entering, candy store, entering our third year. Good for you. With COVID, we shifted and learned so much, launched online sales, curbside pickup, local delivery, shipping, and we end with sales ahead of 2019. Great to hear. Now I'm working on sales growth for 2020. Any advice? Feeling cautiously optimistic. Again, Kristen, you've got three years of history. I would certainly look at that. I think we are on the cusp of a new hedonism. Uh, I think it potentially could be the Roaring Twenties, but make no mistake, it's not going to be easy. You're going to have to fight for every uh, customer because your competitors are going to be uh, also enjoying this groundswell as well. And if, gosh forbid, you live in a state where there are lockdowns or a county, notice that the big boxes are still able to go and people are, are going in there a lot. So your work is going to be cut out for you. But again, make sure that you just know what your numbers are. What do you have to meet? What is your break-even point? And then what's it going to take? What's the sales system you need in place to do that? Yeah, SalesRx, uh, online retail sales training from the retail doc. Alexandra says, I'm wondering how to plan my sales... <laughs> Seems like we're on a roll here. I'm wondering how to plan my sales goals for the months I was closed to the public. I was still able to meet online. Uh, this is kind of the same thing we've just gone over. The bonus structure my staff is based on exceeding sales from the previous year. Um, we were closed to the public from March through September and now only open limited hours. Online sales increased uh, in March and April, but they uh, every month they've shown fell fallen short of last year's total. So Alexandra, I just would say whatever you did before for bonus, 
I think it's going to come down to uh, average check. It's got to be down, again, having a POS system where you know what margin is. So you're knowing what your employees, if they're selling the things you can get margin on, then you may have to look at a different bonus structure. But a simple thing to just to say compared to last year is going to be really tough because quite simply, we've never been through a last year like before. And even though there's a vaccine, make no mistake, there are areas of the country like Los Angeles in particular that are locked down very severely or Manhattan where uh, Midtown just isn't coming back uh, anytime soon. So there's a lot of variance from region to region. Kara says, any advice on how to handle customers who refuse to wear a mask despite the county mandate and store policy? We have some belligerent uh, and ignore us or they refuse. Uh, if they do acknowledge us, they get defensive about their disability. It doesn't allow them to wear a mask. We've had some that made my season staff cry. Aaron adds, our store in rural Virginia and the mask issue has been hard for us. I had to kick somebody out in our store over it on Christmas Eve of all days. We have to do it for our safety and our customer safety. And I wouldn't consider not enforcing it, but it's taken a very real mental toll on us every day since we reopened. Absolutely. But you know what? I went to get my hair cut about a week ago and uh, my barber is quarantined for two weeks. Now, I know the last time I was there, he was telling me how, um, you know, some people didn't take the mask mandate in New York very seriously. I can too. I'm in a very rural area. And from what I see, people have been really at 100% when they go to a grocery store. So why is it different? Um, I think that uh, it's still no mask, no service, no entry. If you want, I would get a security guard to have somebody there once or twice a week and just to show that, that that's important. But again, I think you, everybody's trying to find their way through it and there just isn't enough kindness to move through it. I think also you have to be careful that you're not becoming mask police and that's the most important thing over customer service. I think staff can be generating that and making it worse. But I think it's, it's I'm not dis, dismissing it. It's horrible. I get it. This How this ever became a political issue is beyond me. But let's move on to the very real battle, which is every one of your employees needs to get vaccinated. Now, I'm sure that there are people saying, oh, that's ridiculous. Well, is it? And if you're in a downtown area, imagine if you could go through and say all your stores were vaccinated and it was safe to come uh, to your shopping area. To me, that's where we're going to be looking at as we move through all of this is that herd mentality being able to show that we do a safe, uh, uh, we have safe retail. But again, that's going to be where I think we all have to get our heads around is that's going to be the goal to make sure that everybody in your store is vaccinated and that we can move through this once and for all and get back to what I still think is going to be one of the most hedonistic holiday seasons in 2021 in a very long time. Uh, so there you go. Uh, uh, good morning, Heather in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Things are slow. We did have a, we did have a good holiday season. Uh, good. Glad to hear that morning from Belfast. Tamara, we're just going into another six week lockdown. So we're using part-time furlough and having a rotation for staff coming in for mail order, et cetera. Any ideas on keeping the team together and keeping everybody focused as they're working less hours? That's, that's hard. That's a great point, Tamara. I think the key is um, understanding on Zoom that you can still have a morning huddle, you can still go through and uh, talk about what's going on in the store. I think you ask as many questions as you can and then listen. And just listen to their stories about what they're going through as well, making sure that it's not just, we need to get this out, we need to get this out, but asking and then actively listening. I think that's gonna be the key to holding any team together, that it's not a matter of sharing motivational quotes as much as just being authentic, being in the moment, and then listening to be able to know where you should go the next. I hope that helps. We only have a couple more questions here. Thanks for staying in. Uh, top fan Bryce says, I feel like Facebook really suppressed our post visibility this year, even when we boosted them. I am right with you, Bryce. It's absolutely true. I can guarantee you. What are the best ways to encourage followers to actually look for our posts, check emails, et cetera, best ways to reach customers in 2021? We seem to have our highest support local momentum ever and want to keep investing in that energy. Well, Bryce, let's be honest. I am not going to go looking for your, uh, uh, your store's uh, Facebook page, probably. I'm, it's just not going to happen. There's a lot of other things coming into my feed, and quite simply, unless you boost it to begin with, Facebook isn't going to show it to many people. Um, but you certainly could start a YouTube channel, You know, get into another... Uh, channel that people can subscribe to and be alerted to. I think that certainly helps. 
Uh, but you've got to just keep putting out more content in new ways. So whether that's going to be upping your engagement with a poll or you're going to have a special guest or you're going to do different times of the day or you're going to talk about something different. I think also, uh, I said this last week, improving your uh, audio setup, improving what technologies you use so that you come off looking better, come off uh, being equally well lit. Those kind of things certainly help. But um, it's just a ma matter of all of us trying to figure it out. I can tell you that when I look at a post and I see f that little button from Facebook that says, oh, this is getting more engaging than 90% of your posts, you should boost, boost it. And then I'll, if it's going to my website, I'll boost it. But I typically won't. I used to boost uh, live videos and I won't do that anymore because quite simply, uh, showing it to more people who I don't know, who I can't convert or get onto a mailing list, that's not worth it to me. But when I do and I look back at how that ad per, uh, performed and I start looking at what used to cost me 10 cents to get in front of people and now it was uh, this one I did last week was $1.80. It's like, yeah, Facebook, you're going to kill the good golden goose because um, I'm not going to just be willing to throw money at you. So um, I think the main thing is do people give a damn about listening to your content? If they do, they should be there and you should count on them. And build a tribe. That's what I've been working on for so many times, so much of the day. Um, so that, um, Ahmed says you're, 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 you're on lockdown. You can only sell essential items. I totally get that. But when it comes down to, um, your Facebook and your email, again, email, I could go on all day. You know, we're, if you're on my email list, you know that we're aggressively promoting our webinar. And I sent out an email, I was in the newsletter last Sunday, and I sent out three emails uh, last Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and you'll be happy to know it's going to be in the newsletter night. I'm going to do it again Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and then the following week. And you know why I'm doing that? Because I am seeing that it works and finding out what the subject lines are that work and what I should do and putting a, a, a video with a landing page and doing a lot of new things because I start saying, well, how high is up? I used to think, well, if I got 200 people to sign up for a a webinar, that'd be great. We're already at five and uh, our goal is to get to a thousand because probably only 500 will join me live and then I know I can make a difference in these businesses' lives. Well, ultimately, that's no different for you. Why would they tune in? What are they going to get? How are you going to add value? If it's not value, if all you're giving me is an email that says 20% off this widget this week, that's just not working. And even the big boys have noticed that. So I hope that helps Bryce. And last question, last from Stephen. If you have any other questions, you can go through and uh, type them in and I will look at the very end. Looks like you have a few of them here as well. Stephen, I've been seeing many articles about the hollowing out of the middle class and bifurcation of the market into luxury retail and deep discount retail with little in between. I wouldn't say it's necessarily luxury retail. I think there's full price retail and deep discount. That's certainly the the ones that we're seeing. What advice do you have for stores trying to adjust price and product strategy? Uh, so Stephen, why do you exist? Why the hell do I need to leave my cocoon, my safe little moment, and come to your store? What value do you add? What value does your employees add? What's unique about the way you merchandise it? How do I feel when I leave that store? If you don't know it, and if you to pat yourself on the back, and I've seen an awful lot of people like, oh, our customers love us. I don't care about your customers that are loyal that say that they love you because you probably gave special uh, you know, things to them, which they love, right? What I care about is new people. It's new bodies coming in. How are they converting? What are they finding? What do they end up doing? So yes, there is going to be, uh, it's the same thing in restaurants. It's a lot of things. Either it's going to be high touch, high service or there's going to be minimal touch and it's going to be a discount led mentality. And there's really no money in the discount led mentality. And those of you who have been talking about online and curbside and all that. Yeah, right now you have to do that. But the more times people touch the merchandise, the less money you make. So picking it off the shelf and then putting it on a shelf, well, taking it out of the back room, right? And then putting it on a shelf and then dusting it and keeping it well and moving it from one place to another, that all adds. But then when you pick it up and you have to ship it and something gets dropped or it gets lost and you have to replace it or then it gets returned months or weeks later and how does that all work in? That all costs you margin. So go back to the basics, which is why would anyone shop with you? Why would I choose to go to you over ordering it online? And instead of telling yourself, oh, because we give great customer service, then hire some mystery shoppers and not the ones that like five cents. Our, my mystery shoppers are 70, they get 75 bucks or 80 bucks a shop. Uh, get some real tangible 
information about what it's like to shop in your store and then understand that the only way you're going to be successful is to have a raving band of customers who are willing to tell their friends why you have to come back to that store and what they feel when they're there. If you don't have it, I think you're at risk of being out of business. Make no mistake, it's great the stimulus package has been uh, uh, put into uh, in Congress. I still think it's going to be signed, um, but it's going to come late for a lot of retailers and especially a lot of restauranters. So make sure that you are thinking always, how do I add value? How do I add something new? And how do I get ahead of that online competition that is getting all the press and is going to continue getting all the press? But in the end, when this is over, and it will be over, and I think by summer we're going to see people are going to be out in all states uh, and are going to be out and in restaurants and in re uh, stores and treating themselves again. But how are we up for the challenge? Because you're not going back to what used to be, and it's not just a matter of hiring people uh, who used to work for you. So there you go. All right, so let's take a quick look at... Uh, oh, Bryce, thanks. I'll, I'll definitely try some of those new strategies you haven't done yet. I love hearing that. Holly, we wear a mask, have a shield at checkout, and have every customer's hand sanitizer. All have been very grateful and appreciative when we're doing that in store. I would agree, Holly. I think that's what most people are. And if people want to use you as a kicking bag, they have no point in my store. It would be no different than somebody who walked in and uh, slapped somebody verbally. Uh, I have no po patience for that. You want to swear at an employee. You want to treat them badly. Uh, that's just not it. Darcy, I think we should continue to wear a mask until we through the pandemic. Uh, I would agree. I'm not saying we're not wearing them. That's not it. But I think that vaccination is going to be the new forefront that we're going to have to run into because your own employees are going to say, I'm not going to do it or I don't want to. And then are you going to say it's OK? Or are you going to make that litmus test for someone to come work for you? If it was me, I would prove it. That's it. Heidi, I remember years ago, I me telling you, you needed to own your own content and capture customer info, email marketing. It's exactly why. Otherwise, you're at the whim of Facebook and Instagram, which change daily. It's exactly right. They're only my customers. You know, I have a list of, I think, 70,000, which again, you're welcome for all the emails you're getting because it works. Uh, uh, that's the only way that I have value. That's how I market to people. You either like my worldview and you listen to me and you regularly click an email or you read a blog post and my CRM, which is HubSpot, looks at it and then you get to get other parts for being engaged with me. And if you're not engaged with it, I just assume you leave because quite simply, you're not my customer. But on Facebook, they could all be that. You know, when we get caught up in those vanity metrics, oh, we had 3,000 views. Yeah, look at what Facebook calls a view. It's three seconds. So you went live for an hour. Take a look at your insights. Do you think people stayed with you for an hour? Oh, well, we sold $100. Great. And how much time did that really take you to be able to do it? So don't kid yourself that Facebook and Instagram are perfect and we follow that shiny needle, the most shiny object. The most important thing is how do you make somebody feel that they matter when they walk into your store, when they call and shop with you online? How do you end up being able to add value in a way that says, I value you, I hear you, and I respect you, and I appreciate you choosing me over somebody else? That's kind of it. Tina, same at my store. We have very grateful customers. Thank us for enforcing masks. Of course, we've been told off by a few who refuse and they leave. Doesn't hurt my feelings because 99% who follow rules make it worth it. Yeah, that's exactly it. Uh, Mary, working on video landing pages. That's the new way to go. You know, Gen Z uh, is all about video and uh, we have to find new ways to put video on our um, our websites. And so I'm glad to hear that, Mary. All this forward strategy is cohesive and realistic. That's it. It's got to be forward. So... Um, register for the webinar again. Um, we're gonna we're we're ramping it up because quite simply, I'm trying to get more value to you as much as possible. But make no mistake, it's still up to you to take what I share with you and do something with it. So as you get to the end of this recording with me, and hopefully you've made it past three seconds, because otherwise you're not hearing this. Uh, just put in the chat bar what's one thing you got out of today. What's one thing you're gonna do different? today as a result. What's one thing you're going to do different? All right. What's one thing? Uh, just put that in the chat bar. I'd just love to see what you got out of it. That would be great. Um, just type it in. That's all good. Yeah, Jody, I, I totally get it. There are people that can go through and give, give you bad uh, reviews, but I can tell you I've been flamed by the best of them on Facebook and Google, and there is a way to get rid of those people. Don't let that 
take you away. We need to get more videos. We need to get more reviews. We need to get more people raving about the time they had at your store than sending out yet another 20% off coupon because that's just a margin killer. And it's actually a pretty lazy way to market. market. So there you go. Well, I'd love to see what else you have. I'm gonna leave now, but certainly put in the comments what's one thing you got out of today. And it's been a great year. We learned a lot, so much creativity out there. You're out there doing it. You're trying to figure it out every day. You're joining me on a Sunday morning trying to say, how can I be better? And maybe I'm not gonna say what uh, you want me to say. I don't care, that's not why I'm here. I'm here to make you better. I believe in you, I believe in entrepreneurs, I believe in that spirit of finding a way. And as long as you wake up every morning and think about that, how am I gonna add value to my customers? I think you're gonna have a great 2021 and we're gonna ride it together, provided you join me. And so check out that link, uh, I'll post it as soon as I'm done. Join me on the webinar. And then if you're really serious, if you're finally willing to say, I'm done with doing the same old crap that I've been doing and trying to convince myself that my, uh, this, uh, my employees are really well trained, if you're willing to dive in, then join me for the, face, for the uh, Sales RX Sprint, cost you dollar two, Get started, and then on the January the 14th, we'll charge a 390 to start your subscription to SalesRx, and you will really learn how the retail doc has made the difference on so many brands around the world, why we're in 13 countries, 26 states, over 10,000 people right now that started off just like you and said, maybe I could do better. I'm Bob Fibbs, the retail doc. Thanks for joining me today. I appreciate it, and uh, have a great rest of your holiday. Bye.